I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. Lately, we've been exploring how to live together. That's been my theme. How do we live together? Whether it's my wife and, and me living together, or uh, parents and kids, kids and parents, communities, red states and blue states, whole countries. How does the world live together? Eight billion of us in the one whole human tribe. How do we live together? Last week, I explored bringing realistic optimism to bear in your relationships. Previous weeks, I've explored other, th other things. So tonight, I'd like to talk with you about living together in harmony while taking care of ourselves. And a way into this topic is to tell you a little story about um, a wonderful person I knew from the board. I was on the board of Spirit Rock Meditation Center for nine years altogether, and I got to meet someone named Ajahn Amaro. Amaro uh, was an Englishman who had gone off to, I think, Thailand and Burma in his early 20s, got involved in Buddhism, and developed the name, and was given the name maybe Ajahn, which is an honorific Amaro. And he was being interviewed, and he was asked, so, Anjan, what are you working on these this year? Which I think is a wonderful question for anyone, and certainly for someone who's quite deep in practice. What are you? What's the growing edge for you? <laughs> you know, where are you really awake, and what's still kind of neurotic? What are you dealing with these days? It's an honest and fair and good question. And I know him personally as a very, very uh, witty, warm, bright, deeply practiced person, uh, and. I was particularly struck, therefore, by his answer to the question. He said, well, this year I've decided to give up contentiousness. Contentiousness? Argumentativeness? Quarrelsomeness? Bickering? Getting pushy? Getting attached to your view? What? You? Ajahn Amaro? You? And yet, in his honesty and sincere and deep commitment to the greatest good of all, the heartwood of practice, the real gold, not the fool's gold of gradual awakening. In that commitment, he was dealing with subtleties probably, but still realities of his own contentiousness. That word, contentiousness, and the abandonment of contentiousness really struck me. And it's been something I've been practicing with a lot ever since. Maybe in part because as a person, I'm someone who can think he's right. And I grew up in a family and then in a school system and in a profession that rewards people for being right and being the one who knows. And, um, you know, the one who establishes social standing in part by being right. So I had some work to do, and uh, I'd like to share with you some of that when we talk here, but I just want to introduce this notion. What is it to be needlessly contentious, distinct from being peaceable, friendly, and fearless, distinct from speaking truth to power, being appropriately fiery when it's time for that, being firm to protect yourself and, and others? How is that different? from contentiousness. Well, in contentiousness, quarrelsomeness, we uh, struggle with others and we try to make things happen. And we can get caught up in a secondary matter of arguing about our position. It's one thing to offer a view. It's one thing to state a value and to state it firmly and clearly with gravity and real heft and seriousness. It's another thing to be, get caught up in endless arguments about it that take on a life of their own. 
I think about Ajahn Amaro and other uh, teachers I knew from the board at Spirit Rock Meditation Center. And I came out of a business environment, and I also came out of a kind of a human potential environment, and also a therapeutic environment, which was a lot about mixing it up with other people. And there's some value in that, especially for someone who was so inhibited, like myself initially. Still, I would watch these teachers in the Spirit Rock board meeting, where there would be a real disagreement about something important. And teacher A would offer a view, and it would plop right there in the middle of the floor. A moment of quiet. Teacher B would offer a view that opposed, it was divergent from, the view of teacher A. Plop. And I thought to myself, all right, game on. <laughs> let, the, let the battle begin. Except there wasn't a battle. There was no battle would be a little pause, and then Teacher C would offer a view, maybe siding with Teacher A or a fusion of A and B or something different altogether. Plop, and there I would be. And what I observed was that people did not go to battle over their view. They might, as a discussion evolved, circle back to what they had originally said and restate it or underline something that supported what they had to say, but you never got a feeling that there was a lot of topspin in what they were tossing out and placing in the commons bef before us all. They weren't being contentious about it. And precisely because, in fact, they were not adding all that ordinary, what I would have added, <laughs> you know, grinding their point home, uh, their point was ever more powerful. The non-contentiousness of the offering of their firmly held, sincerely held view actually made it more persuasive. Very interesting. And I even remember a particular uh, episode, I forget the exact basis for it. It involved the relationship between Spirit Rock Meditation Center and its sister monastery, Abayagiri, in Northern California a very harmonious relationship and a mutually supportive one. And there was something about a program that Spirit Rock was doing with them. I'm not revealing anything inappropriate here. And uh, the monastics, they're all monks, male monks, identified male, um, and some kind of apprentice monks up there at Abayagiri, the, the senior monks, ended up writing a letter to the board of Spirit Rock expressing some um, displeasure with uh, a, a policy we had taken and an approach we had taken, I think, financially, and in a very clear way, without contentiousness, they communicated uh, really quite a powerful view with a lot of dignity and gravity. And when that letter landed in the circle of the Spirit Rock board meeting, it was not just a plop, it was a plop. And still, no contentiousness in it, no topspin, no attitude, no make wrong, no righteousness, no dominance move, no superiority, no mud in the water, no secondary issues. Clean as a whistle, plop. Just imagine the cost to you of contentiousness one way or another. And to reiterate, we can err on either side. We can err on the side of being really contentious and argumentative and quarrelsome. Or, you know, we can err on the side of muzzling ourselves, silencing ourselves needlessly subordinating ourselves to others. Both are problematic. And to reiterate, you know, we're talking here about the place for saying what you think and see and, and want when it's appropriate without getting distracted by the noise and the emotional overhead, the friction of contentiousness. That's what we're talking about here.
And it might be really useful to think about this in some of your relationships. What are examples for when you let something go by, not out of playing small, but just you look at that pitch going by with all of its top spin, top spin, and you know cred attached to it, and you just think to yourself, "Nah, I don't need to take a swing at that one. I don't need to get sucked into the vortex of dealing with that. I just don't need that." You might think of an example like that. You also might think of another example of when you've gotten caught up in contentiousness. Now, obviously, each of us has to decide what is an appropriate restatement of what we're trying to say or a, an appropriate speak, continuing to speak when someone's trying to interrupt you or an appropriate calling something out in the process of a meeting or a company or a relationship. You know, we each have to decide where the boundaries are. And, you know, they could be a little fuzzy, but basically where the boundaries are between that and getting caught up in it. I know for me, the, the warning signs are things like, I start to develop a feeling of insistence. And, you know, <laughs> yellow light, orange light, red light, insistence. Or I start getting very caught up in me about it. I take it personally. I want to establish my view, possessiveness, my view. I, I start getting identified with a certain course of action, you know. Or I start feeling really threatened about it. These are all clues of contentiousness that we're starting to get into trouble. A little example from earlier today in which I'm happy to say I did not get into contentiousness. So I was driving with my wife to um, Sacramento. It's about an hour and a half plus each way, a fair amount of driving. And there's a portion of that drive, if you live in Northern California, I live in San Rafael, that's on Highway 37. It's a single lane each way uh, for five or 10 miles, actually. And uh, we were behind a truck who was driving quite slowly. And um, just contextually, my wife, as I would say, a, a little anxious about being in a car. And so there I was, kind of approaching the, tr the truck, looking at it, starting to back off the accelerator as the distance closed. And I was sort of muttering to myself, ah, oh, you're going kind of slowly there about the truck. And my wife then offered some explanation that there was no way to get around the truck. And, um, you know, it was just a one lane highway. And so I, I just should slow down and, and relax. Well, <laughs> So what do we have there? <laughs> we have someone who's educating me about what I could plainly see already. It's a one-lane highway. And who, in effect, there's an implicit correction of my behavior uh, with a certain instruction, a command in it. Definitely any one of those three elements, getting schooled, getting corrected, getting commanded, any one of those uh, could prompt a certain response, especially if you have a history like I do of growing up in a family where there was a lot of that that was needless. Well, I'm happy to say that I was on my game and I, I contemplated it. I could feel a little bit of reactivity arising and I just kind of let it go. And I let it go into uh, what for me is been a kind of a saying I've drawn upon. You might find value in it or adapting it to your own purposes. Mind like air or mind like water, mind like air. Fluid, spacious, nothing solid, nothing to get fixed around or to fight against in your own mind. I'm not denying the solidity of the person sitting next to me or the solidity of the truck or the car, but inside your own mind, mind like air rather than mind with all these kind of solid objects banging against each other. Mind like air. And I just let it go. I disengaged. I mean, I could observe it. I could think to myself what I've shared with you here. And while at the same time, having, you know, an understanding of the context, goodwill for my wife, love for her, not a deal. I could bring to bear my understanding in the 
chess game of relationships or that if if I move out my night aggressively and started arguing with her, that would, you know, create a kind of a hassle that would color the atmosphere in the car for at least another 10 or 20 minutes, if not the greater part of the day. I didn't need that. It wasn't worth it. A lot of costs, not many benefits. So I let it go. Not contentious. And boy, did I feel good about that. And it turned out pretty well as a result. So that's a small example. So I invite you to think about an example in which um, you were not contentious and an example uh, of an interaction or even a relationship broadly that's been colored by contentiousness. Not to be clear, in certain situations, it's fairly easy, right? I was rolling along on the highway. I had eaten some food. I slept well. I was physically comfortable. The emotional atmosphere with my wife was good. I wasn't preoccupied with something really stressful. I get it. You know, it's, there's, a, there's a continuum, right, of challenge. So what we work at is what Gil Fronstel, you know, the wonderful teacher, said, which is we work in our practice to expand the range of experiences in which we are free. Not so much expanding the range of situations, but expanding the range of the experiences we have in situations with you know, growing intensity and implications for us. We're trying to expand the range of experiences in which we are free in our relationship to them. They're arising. Anger may be arising. You know, there's a little irritation. Uh, it was a little miffedness, certainly, and my own, you know, viewpoint in the car earlier today with my wife. But there can be more and more shock absorbers around those experiences, more of a sense of freedom in relationship with them, which is really helped by a sense of your own streaming of consciousness as fluid, as air-like, as water-like, rather than brick-like and solid with things banging up against each other. And that's what we do in our practice. We try to establish you know, where we are, push into our growing edge, establish that, and keep on going, and thus expanding the range of experiences in which we're free. To do that, it really helps to draw on wisdom from many, many, many traditions. And I'd like to offer here um, a passage from uh, some of the teachings of the Buddha that have survived over the centuries and come down to us today. And uh, it's one of my very favorite uh, teachings in the Buddhist tradition. So this is from a collection of teachings called the Majima Nikaya. A Nikaya is essentially a collection, the Majima, the middle length discourses of the Buddha. And uh, if you've ever had a chance to look through these suttas, these fundamental teachings, in a good translation, such as from Bhikkhu Bodhi, and there are other excellent translators out there, access to insight.org, access to insight.org has many collections of wonderful translations, including from different translators, which is often useful and interesting, um, of these ancient texts in Pali, a language of early Buddhism, whose earliest uh, surviving written record appeared probably about 2,200, 2,300 years ago. And there are other early surviving records of the Buddhist teachings in Chinese, and I think also in, in another ancient language from India. In any case, I want to read you this, all right? So the context here, again, located time of the Buddha, 2,500 years ago, uh, the context is that the Buddha is going to visit three elderly monastic uh, men, you know, three elderly men, older men, who live together in a forest. And they're, they're pretty developed in their practice. So this is a little aspirational. And I'm going to read stuff and um, see if you can, you can hear the voice of the Buddha and the voice of these people coming down to us over the centuries. Yes, with some traditional expressions, yes, the culture of their day, yes, in the framework of people living the monastic life, and still, for me at least, so much that's relevant here. And by the way, I put this particular sutta uh, in the chat. You can see it. It's Majima Nikaya 31, the Kula Gosinga Sutta. 
Kula Gosinga Sutta. Here we go. So, when the three monks were seated with the Buddha who came to visit them, the Buddha said to them, I hope you are all keeping well. And he addressed the eldest among them, An Anuruddha. I hope you are all keeping well, Anuruddha. I hope you are all comfortable. I hope you are not having any trouble getting alms food. Vows of poverty, renunciates, entirely dependent on the generosity of the local villagers. Anuruddha replied, We are keeping well, O Buddha. We are comfortable, and we are not having any trouble getting alms food. The Buddha replied, I hope, Anuruddha, that you are all living in concord, with mutual appreciation, without disputing blending like milk and water, viewing each other with kindly eyes. It's one of my favorite passages. Blending like milk and water, viewing each other with kindly eyes. Surely, venerable sir, Anuruddha replied, we are living in concord with mutual appreciation, without disputing, blending, like milk and water, viewing each other with kindly eyes. But Anuruddha, the Buddha said, how do you live thus? Anuruddha responded, Venerable sir, as to that, I think thus, it is a gain for me, it is a great gain for me, that I am living with such companions in the holy life, a life of practice. I maintain bodily acts of loving kindness towards these venerable ones I live with, both openly and privately. I maintain verbal acts of loving kindness towards them, both openly and privately. I maintain mental acts of loving kindness towards them, both openly and privately within myself. Good, good, Anuruddha, the Buddha said. I hope that you all abide diligent, ardent, and resolute. Surely, venerable sir, we do abide diligent, ardent, and resolute. By the way, these are three common words, diligent, ardent, which means enthusiastic and heartfelt, and resolute. And you might think about them as watchwords for your own practice. Are you ardent? Do you have heart in it? Are you diligent? You know, do you stick with it? And are you resolute? Are you fundamentally determined on, on behalf of yourself in your own healing and growing and awakening? Diligent, ardent, and resolute. Then I'm going to offer some detail here from Anuruddha that is located in the time, but it gives you a feeling for how these people live together. So the Buddha says, but Anuruddha, how do you do that? How do you abide diligent, resolute, and ardent? Anuruddha replied, Venerable sir, as to that, whichever of us returns first from the village with alms food, prepares the seats, sets out the water for drinking and for washing, and puts the refuse bucket in its place. Whichever of us returns last, eats any food left over, if he wishes. Otherwise, he throws it away where there is no greenery, or drops it into water where there is no life. He puts away the seats in the water for drinking and for washing. He puts away the refuse bucket after washing it, and he sweeps out the refectory where we live. Whoever notices that the pots of water for drinking, washing, or the latrine are low or empty, takes care of them. If they are too heavy for him, he calls someone else by a signal of the hand, and they move it by joining hands. But because of this, we do not break out into speech. But every five days, we sit together all night discussing the Dharma. In other words, they're, they practice noble silence most of the time, but they do talk about their practice every, every few days. That is how we abide diligent, ardent, and resolute. I just find it incredibly sweet 
I mean, you couldn't make that stuff up, right? <laughs> it gets so concrete and specific. In the way of living together, again, in that time, we could translate it into the present. They're looking out for each other. They're not, you know, bean counting or keeping score. Right? They're, they're living together harmoniously. And in particular, they deliberately practice bodily acts of loving kindness, verbal acts of loving kindness, and mental acts of loving kindness toward each other. They they don't just abstain from contentiousness. They maintain a kind of good-hearted lean toward each other. Now, of course, they're living in conditions in which they can do that. And there are a lot of examples from the Buddha Dharma of, um, you know, the Buddha talking about people that you can't live that way with. And so you don't try to. On the other hand, you don't get contentious with them. You don't get violent with them. You don't go out of your way to, uh, to quarrel with them. You, you know, you disengage and you make your own way. So there's certainly an allowance for that. There's certainly people that, you know, who um, in our human evolution, for example, one of the absolute necessary requirements for our species to develop altruism and the generosity and caring and sharing as the foundation of, of social life with each other which is unique in our primate species, by the way, the only way we could do that is by identifying and punishing freeloaders. If you don't identify and punish freeloaders, ripoff artists, in a social band, then it's dangerous to become altruistic. You're less likely to survive to see the sunrise and pass on your genes. So you see, the capacity to be really clear about who's willing to be cooperative with appropriate consequences around it, which could be simply disengagement from them and um, excluding them from your social life. That's absolutely necessary to be able to live in this non-contentious way. Right? That said, with many of the people in our lives, there is the basis for living together like milk and water, blending together, and living harmoniously. It's a high bar, isn't it? It's not the typical mode of, you know, attaching through bickering that many people have, a way of being both connected and distancing, attaching through bickering. There are people who get a kick out of quarreling. I think it's fun to argue about some stuff, to have a difference of views, you know, to have your view and other people have their view. Okay, you know, there's a place for that. But that's really different from getting upset about it and identified with it and caught up in it. So to finish, think about what it might mean for you to lay down the burden of contentiousness, argumentativeness, quarrelsomeness, you know, driving your point home, chasing your position, showing them what's true. Just think about that. Think about subtle ways with an eye roll or a, an exasperated sigh. <sighs> you know, or the, are you kidding me? Kind of thing. Think about social media and how many people get caught up in contentiousness in it. Right? Uh, you know, there's a saying in social media, don't feed the trolls. It's like, don't feed them, because that just feeds into their game. They're trying to suck airtime. So think about for yourself, what might be helpful for you in your key relationships around disengaging from contentiousness and, and disengaging from the contentiousness of others. Very often, others try to draw us into contentiousness for all kinds of reasons. Sometimes they just don't know any other way to interact, even though it's still problematic. Sometimes there's a kind of script-like quality in our relationships that has a history to it, that has a contentious quality to it. And we get sucked into the script, or people try to cast us into certain roles, or put words in our mouths, or get us going. Um, you know, I 
I talked with their son when he was young about kids at school that would try to get a rise out of him. And I described them basically as putting you know, bait on a hook, like he was the fish. And they were throwing bait in the water and trying to hook him into getting into some kind of argument with them. So we can be aware also of other people who try to you know, be contentious with us. And we can think about what would help us to take care of ourselves. What's the way of being in which you are taking care of yourself, you are taking care of those you care about with the full weight of your being, the full seriousness and gravity and a sense of moral entitlement, moral confidence, without getting self-righteous about it or contentious about it. Well, that's what I invite you to. And I invite you this week to be aware of how often contentiousness colors relationships. And it can seem like the only way to be. And to look for ways to stay out of those scripts of contentiousness, to not start the quarrel. And sometimes when the baited hook comes your way, to swim on by. Okay, so in no particular order, Faith W. So uh, my question is, <clears throat> in terms of contentiousness, how do you manage those feelings of like, I don't want to be stepped all over or bullied or I don't, do you know what I'm saying? Like I, you oh, yeah. get into this engagement with people you need to tell your people, but I know it's an internal process. So how do you, how do you manage that? Oh, that's really great. Uh, you know, what a good one. And so I, I think it's helpful to establish in your own mind. One good thing is to have models you know, of people who bring it both together. And weird example, maybe I'm watching, my wife and I are starting to watch a TV series. We, we like it a lot called The First Lady. And Michelle Obama, um, Betty Ford, and uh, Eleanor Roosevelt are profiled. All of whom, in their way, still cast into certain pretty constricted roles and carrying a lot of weight. You know, you think about Michelle Obama obviously carrying a double weight there, who in many, many ways seem to have this way of bringing it home with no bull without tipping into a kind of losing their footing, whatever that might be. They just come to mind for me most immediately. I can think of other people in history that are models for me and people that I've known, like I've Ajahn Amaro is, a, is an example for me like that. So it's really useful to have models. To, so you realize there is a way of not knuckling under, not letting myself be pushed around anymore, you know, not oppressing myself anymore, you know, like, or allowing that to happen inside my own mind without losing your footing. I think that's really helpful, part one. Yeah, part two is to look for areas in your life where you do have agency and you are powerful, maybe outside of relationships. So you, and so you can start internalizing more of a sense of personal power uh, that, that becomes kind of a more and more of a bone deep confidence as you take in the good, as I talk about, uh, for a breath or longer, marinating in that experience of your personal power so that when inevitably, you know, someone's a jerk, right? It happens, <laughs> uh, right? Unfortunately, often. And then more and more, you just feel like, what's your stake in the game? Then it's not existential. It's not a matter of having to prove to yourself or to them that you're a strong, capable, upright person. It's not existential because deep in your bones, you know it's true. You don't have to prove it to them. You don't have to fight that fight with them. I think that's a really helpful thing. And yeah, um, yeah, what do you think about those two things? Um, I think I like the idea. I actually really like Michelle Obama and I, I do agree with you. She, she walks that line and she does it uh, very well. Yeah. Um, and then your second point about internally I think you hit on something in terms of like 
areas in my life where I don't feel very powerful. And so when something happens or there's an engagement, it really hits that core. Yeah. So it just exasperates things, right? Like yeah. I get revved up and so, yeah, very helpful. Thank you. That's great. If, if I could just add, offer one more. Um, yeah. Uh, the way I'll put it is in terms of refuge, profound theme, right? We have external refuges, you know, places of sanctuary. We have internal refuges. And I think it's really helpful. It's certainly been helpful for me to establish an internal refuge that feels unassailable, feels protected. And inside this core, that person over there, let's say, is saying all kinds of stuff that I know is not true or, you know, being accusatory, critical, or, you know, trying to bring the big thumb, squelch me or something like that. And it really helps to be able to go into that inner refuge so you know what's really true. You know what's really true, and you know what you're really going to do, which often means it really doesn't matter what they say, because you're still going to do this, or you're still going to be with other people who are more on your side and reasonable, right? It helps to really know that in your core. So then you, again, it doesn't feel so existential. You feel solid in your core. Uh, and then from your from that solidity, you can keep a cool head, you know, and you play your cards, like what's in your best interest? Or what are the real stakes here? Or what's the long-term game? The long-term game, yeah. Um, and I, I find very often you know, the long-term game is very much about uh, it's it's I'm gonna put it, it's 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 about being, not doing, like we did in the meditation. It's about who are you being. If you're being calm, dignified, not cowed about, not submitting, not pushed around, but also not getting um, feuding, you know getting caught up in fussing and feuding and, and blustering and, and um, sputtering, right? Sputtering, which it, then you realize, oh, what, let that other person look like an asshole. You know, I'm, I'm not going there, you know? And that's what really matters. Long after the words have gone away, you know, the line, what Maya Angelou, people will forget what you said. They'll never forget how you made them feel. They'll, they won't forget your energy, your vibe, how you were. And I think that often has the most impact, and that's how to win over time. Often we have multiple innings. I think about that, and you're playing the long game to win. You can think to yourself, what this person is doing and what I'm doing is probably the third or fourth in a dozen of these. And I'm interested in prevailing over the long haul. So... I'm going to let them I'm going to let them bluster and bully and look like a real jerk and I'm just going to be calm and clear-eyed and I see them and they know I see them and other people know I see them in this kind of unassailable sense of self-worth and dignity and confidence. True. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you well, so much. That was awesome. Appreciate Thank it. you. Yeah, I uh -huh. appreciate it. Okay, great. Okay, uh D Whitmore yeah, I'm asking you to unmute D Whitmore. Hi, I'm Diane. Diane, hi Diane. Um, hi, I have um, am lucky enough to have a friend since I was seven years old, and um, but we've been arguing and bickering and fighting since we were seven, and while we repair very well, um, I feel sometimes like, uh, you know, I'll be asked a question, an unanswerable question, and any answer to that question will um, provoke a flare up. And mm. um, I, I really heard uh, your response to faith, um, and that's really useful. And I've been trying to think about, you know, how I can use humor. Um, but if you have any uh, hot tips, um, uh, yeah. yeah. Quick question. Uh, in the next few days. Yeah. Is this someone that you can go to the process level with, which is like a, or the meta level? It's like the fancy way of putting. Can you, can you talk about talking? I, yeah, I think so. Um, if, 
if we're not in a triggering uh, yeah. mode, sure. Well, then that's often a really wonderful move. And to even, you know, kind of say, can we talk about talking? And uh, then the person might get contentious about that. And then, well, can we talk about talking about talking? <laughs> but at some point you're moving out, you know, in the frame so that at some point, hopefully they'll be willing to talk with you. And, and if they won't, I mean, for me, obviously, if a person is unwilling to have a bit of a reasonable conversation about the way you interact with each other, including, frankly, about how they're being in the interaction, uh, that really constrains interactions and relationships. It kind of means you're sort of stuck with how they're being, and then you have to decide what you're going to do. It's a little bit like you're interested in dancing the cha-cha, and they're interested in tango or something, and gears are grinding. If you can't talk about how you're going to dance with each other, then you have to decide, what do I want to do with someone who will only waltz? And then you figure that out. But hopefully you two can talk with each other about it. And then you could just say, you know, just an observation. And by the way, I find it often helps to deliberately start out one down. What I mean by that is that if you start out one down in the power structure, and this, you got to be careful about it, especially if you belong to a group of people that's been structurally, systemically put one down. But, uh, and it's easier if you like me, I was a lot of privilege to go one down, right? But with a friend even, you can kind of go one down deliberately and for example, uh, call out yourself. Now you're both doing it and maybe the most egregious examples are from them, but still, you know, you can, um, you could say, well, what I notice, I got to admit it. What I notice is last time we were together recently, I asked you how you were doing. You said this. And then I, I got on my high horse about it or however you want to put it, you know, in a kind of semi-funny, informal, cheeky way. And gosh, I just, I don't know. I just noticed that sometimes that kind of sort of happens in our interactions and it derails them. And, you know, I, I know for myself, at least, I grew up in a culture in which people kind of argued as a way of life. And um, and I, I just feel as I get older, I, I just want to do less and less of that because it crowds out so much that's good, like in our relationship. I don't know. What do you think about that? I just made it up. But it's a, so you're going, you're not coming in accusatorily. If you're talking about process, it's so easy to get into accusation about them. It's much more useful to start with yourself and cop to your own part first even if their part is actually much more egregious. That's one. Um, yeah, the other thing is, I'll just finish on this. I found in interactions, uh, I see what's coming on the chat. Uh, let's see. Uh, but what is the person, you know, Linda Robinson at 29 minutes afterward. Uh, what is What about the person who always wants to be contentious and Waltz is your sibling. What do you do then? And I, I can relate. Um, and Linda continues, I end up just going quiet and not bothering. And sometimes that's the best you can do, really. Other times, and I find this is kind of interesting, is you, you say something and then the other person gets caught up in this sort of argumentative tangent about it. And, you know, you let them wrap, you know, do their thing. Then when they kind of wind down, you just go back to your original point, almost as if they hadn't said anything. <laughs> you know, not in a contemptuous way, but just you're just coming back to your mode of dancing. If someone's actively gaslighting you, same thing. They do the gaslighting, they do it, and then you speak the truth again. It's almost as if what they're you're you're in you're in a parallel movie. You don't get sucked into their movie. You keep reestablishing your movie. At a certain point, you have to ask yourself, is it worth doing this? I have friends, and they're not stupid. About the third time this happens, they notice it between us. And they realize, oh, Rick's not getting sucked in to my 
bickering or weird tangent or trolling or provocative sidebar. You know, I'm just, and I'm coming back to my way of being. So for example, you might stay out of being contentious. Also the tone, maybe the other person is getting all feisty and you just sort of stay calm and friendly and warm. But the third or fourth cycle of that, other people often start to notice, huh? And they might even get drawn into your way of being. That, that's another thing potentially to do. Uh, yeah. Well, this was a, yeah, I'm gonna finish by, I, I really appreciate the person, I'm not tracking your, I can't remember your name, who put in the, the text, the ancient text in the sutta. There we go, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah, very much for doing that. Nine minutes past the hour, you can see that text. And it's really good, Sarah, how quickly you tracked that down after I started talking about it. So just to finish again, if I could, let's let this sink in. Ask yourself, you know, what it would be like with a relationship or an interaction or as a, as a value, right, to live in concord with mutual appreciation without disputing, blending like milk and water, viewing each other with kindly eyes. I notice that we here almost always actually do this in the chat, even if there's a difference of view, even if um, you know we're talking about tricky charged things, still peop we, we here in our community, this Wednesday Sangha, we do live, I think, in concord with each other, with mutual appreciation, without disputing, blending like milk and water, viewing each other with kindly eyes. I feel that from you and I, I hope to offer that to you myself and I hope you can offer it to each other. So thank you.